Hello, my name is Ryan Tai, and I am the Program Director for the Musculoskeletal Imaging and Intervention Fellowship at UMass Chan Medical School. Today, I am going to go over the fundamentals of imaging of the bone marrow with an emphasis on MRI. So for today's brief talk, we will be first discussing the MRI evaluation of bone marrow, describing the components of bone marrow, illustrating the normal evolution of bone marrow from infancy to adulthood, discussing the normal patterns of bone marrow on MRI, recognizing the pathologic appearance of bone marrow on MRI, and then illustrating a few examples of abnormal bone marrow processes. First, starting with the MRI evaluation of bone marrow. MRI is considered a diagnostic gold standard in the evaluation of bone marrow given its excellent soft tissue resolution. Whole body MRI can be used to evaluate for multiple myeloma and metastases. MRI is more sensitive compared to bone scan and can provide additional information such as neurologic complications within the spine. The evaluation of bone marrow hinges on T1-weighted sequence. Normal bone marrow signals should be brighter than adjacent muscles on a T1-weighted images due to the presence of fat. If the bone marrow is hypo-intense to muscle, then this is worrisome for a pathologic bone marrow replacement process. If the bone marrow is iso-intense to muscle on the T1-weighted images, this is a diagnostic dilemma and can indicate either a pathologic bone marrow replacement process or a red marrow. In this setting, the use of in-and-out phase imaging may be helpful as a problem-solving tool. You may be familiar with in-and-out phase imaging in other applications, for example, for the evaluation of adrenal adenomas. The use of in-and-out phase imaging in bone marrow hinges on a premise that neoplastic processes usually completely replace bone marrow fat and non-neoplastic processes such as red marrow conversion do not completely replace normal bone marrow fat. In-and-out phase imaging looks for the presence of intravoxel fat, which may suggest a non-neoplastic process such as red marrow conversion. Water and fat protons have different resonance frequencies. At different echo times, the signals from water and fat will vary. With a 1.5 tesla magnet, at 2.2 milliseconds, water and fat will be out of phase and will result in a drop in signal if both water and fat coexist within the voxel. At 4.4 milliseconds, water and fat will be in phase. The TEs for in and out phase imaging will differ for different field strength magnets. In this MRI of the sacrum, the bone marrow is diffusely heterogeneous on a T1-weighted image and appears iso-intense to muscles, which may suggest red marrow reconversion or a pathologic bone marrow replacement process. There is clear drop of signal on the out-of-phase image relative to the in-phase image confirming the presence of intravoxel fat. As such, this patient likely has pronounced red marrow. On this MRI of the shoulder, there is a small lesion within the humeral head that does not drop in signal on the out-of-phase image relative to the in-phase image. This patient has no metastatic lung cancer to the bone and this lesion is presumed to be a metastasis. So next, let's discuss the normal composition of bone marrow. Red marrow is the portion of marrow that is actively involved in hematopoiesis. As such, it contains hematic poetic stem cells and progeny with a rich sinusoidal vascular supply and comprises of approximately 40% water, 40% fat, and 20% protein. Yellow marrow is a portion of marrow that is not actively involved in hematopoiesis and has sparse vascular supply and comprises of approximately 80% fat, 15% water, and 5% protein. So now let's talk about the normal evolution of bone marrow from infancy to adult. The maturation of marrow progresses in a very predictable way as shown here. Within long bones, the epiphysis and apophysis will mature to yellow marrow first, followed by the diaphysis, distal metaphysis, and proximal metaphysis. Here's a schematic showing the progression of red marrow to yellow marrow. At 24 weeks of gestation, the marrow becomes the primary site of hematopoiesis. At birth, active hematopoiesis is present throughout the entire skeleton. Red marrow birth is very cellular. In children, the epiphysis and the mid-diaphysis starts to convert to yellow marrow. And in adults, most of the marrow is yellow marrow with the exception of the proximal metaphysis of long bones as well as in areas of the pelvis, spine, and sternum. So next, let's talk about the normal appearance of bone marrow. Red marrow should be intermediate in signal on both fluid and T1-weighted sequences and should be brighter than muscle on a T1-weighted sequences. Within the long bone, marrow should be most pronounced within the proximal metaphysis. 
Yellow mirror, given its predominance of fat, should be bright on the T1, T2, and proton density weighted sequences, and dark on the fat saturated and fluid sensitive sequences. Red mirror reconversion represents the physiologic recruitment of hematopoietic elements. Causes are broad and may include anemias, increased oxygen demands, as well as physiologic states of increased erythropoiesis, for example, during pregnancy. The sequence of conversion from yellow marrow to red marrow is the exact opposite of what we saw with marrow maturation. So the last site to mature to yellow marrow is the first site to convert back to red marrow. So the proximal metaphysis will convert first, and the epiphysis and apophysis should convert last. So next, let's talk about the pathologic patterns of bone marrow. First, we have already talked extensively about signal abnormality. If bone marrow is darker than muscle on T1-weighted images, this is worrisome for bone marrow replacement process. Next is location. Remember, we said that the epiphysis should be the last site to convert from yellow marrow to red marrow with red marrow reconversion. So if there is less fat signal within the epiphysis compared to the metaphysis on a T1-weighted images, this is not normal. And lastly is distribution. If bone marrow signal is asymmetric compared to the contralateral side, then further investigation is also required. So next, let's talk about a couple examples of abnormal bone marrow processes. Starting with bone marrow hyperplastic processes, which represents conditions of pathologic hyperplasia of bone marrow elements and includes conditions such as essential thrombocytosis, mastocytosis, and mild dysplastic syndromes. Clues to bone marrow hyperplastic processes include abnormal distribution of red marrow as well as abnormal marrow signal. Correlation with clinical presentation and laboratory values is key. So here's an MRI of a shoulder in a patient with essential thrombocytosis. Within the epiphysis, there's disproportionate amount of what looks like red marrow relative to metaphysis, which is not consistent with red marrow reconversion and is compatible with their known history of essential thrombocytosis. Metastasis is also a very common cause of bone marrow replacement process. Common etiologies in adults include prostate, breast, lung, renal cell, melanoma, thyroid, and GI malignancies. And common etiologies in children include neuroblastoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, and Ewing sarcoma. Usually, metastases spread hematogenously, and the sites commonly afflicted with metastases are sites rich in vascularity and red marrow, usually the pelvis, vertebra, as well as the sternum. The MRI appearance of metastases include T1 hypointense lesions with the exception of melanoma and hemorrhagic metastases, whereby the lesions may appear hyperintense on T1-weighted imaging, but will remain hyperintense with fat saturation. Usually, metastases are T2 hyperintense unless the lesions are sclerotic or fibrotic. Contrast is typically not necessary, but can be helpful. Other features of metastases may include a halo sign where there is a peripheral rim of T2 hyperintense signal surrounding a lesion, as well as morphologic changes of the bone. So here's an example of an MRI of a patient with metastatic lung adenocarcinoma. There are lesions that are hyperintense on a STIR image and hypointense on a T1-weighted image within the sacrum as well as the posterior elements of L1. Gelatinous bone marrow transformation or serous atrophy of the bone marrow is a very interesting phenomenon in which the bone marrow becomes hypoplastic and undergoes infiltration with gelatinous material. Risk factors include severe protein catabolic and malnourished states, for example, in patients with anorexia, AIDS, long-standing alcohol use, and severe systemic illness. On MRI, the bone marrow appears diffusely hypointense on the T1-weighted sequences and hyperintense on the STIR sequences. The extent of abnormality is so extensive that the T1 sequence looks like a STIR sequence and vice versa, whereby the images appear to be mislabeled. Here's an example of an ankle MRI of a patient with severe malnutrition. You can see how diffusely hypointense the bone marrow is on a T1-weighted image and hyperintense on the STIR image, the exact opposite of what we would have expected with normal bone marrow. So the main takeaway points for today's brief talk is that the T1-weighted sequence is the most critical in validating the bone marrow. The bone marrow should be normally hyperintense to muscle on a T1-weighted images. It is also important to validate the distribution of red marrow and yellow marrow. Corresponding clinical information is critical in generating an accurate differential diagnosis.
Hope you found this talk to be informative. Be sure to check out the SSR Resident Education Club, which features interactive lectures and more recorded Bytes lectures on the SSR YouTube channel. Also, follow the SSR on social media to hear more about upcoming lectures and events. Thank you very much.